Okay, we okay, we're on. Thank the Lord. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land where I'm bound. Yeah, that's a little short part of that song, but I got my difficulties handled and I do know what we want to talk about today. But we should want to go to that land. If you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, there is a heavenly Mount Zion. You can want to go over there to that Mount Zion or go to Zion over there that's in Israel right now. And if your skin looks like mine, you're not going to be welcome right now. I say you're not going to be welcome. If you go over there talking about God most high, you're not going to be welcome. But there's a heavenly Jerusalem. There's a heavenly Mount Zion where the spirit of just men made perfect resides. And that's that land where I'm bound. Now understand, that's not the only one. The Bible says that the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So yes, I'm looking forward to that day just as well that the Most High will do what he said he's gonna do because he's good and making all of his promises come to pass. Today, we're gonna to talk about the imposition of God. The imposition of God should really terrify us. But to most people, the imposition of God is an inconvenience. It's an annoyance. It is something that we many times feel that we can do without. Yet God imposing himself upon us, our ways, and our everyday life allows us to understand how small man is and how great and how vast and how wonderful he is. But often we don't realize the power that he exhibits in his imposition. We don't see him as he is. We don't see him as someone that we should be terrified of. And a lot of that has to do with we've been taught about God in different kind of compartment. God, as it's been taught, is love. God is good. God is peace. But when we start to look at God as he defines himself in the everlasting word of God, we don't get the opportunity to put him in compartments because what ends up happening is we put him in compartments. What's wrong? You, you, uh, something's probably, I'll, I'll make it come back up again in a minute. We don't see him as he is. What we do is we say, well, he's peace one time, he's love one time, and what we end up doing is making him have different sections. He's not like that. The Most High God is 100% in every aspect of his being. And since he is totality of who he is in all of his being, to break him up, can you see me now? To break him up into little pieces, will allow an individual to have a God of their choice. 
you'll hear people say, you shouldn't fear God. You should only respect him. We're gonna deal with that today. Our work in text will be in the 37th chapter of the book of Job. Does that mean that I cut my phone went off? Give me, a, give me a moment, you all. Okay. So our working text is going to be the 37th chapter of Job. But in order for us to get where we need to be, we're going to need to understand why it is that the imposition of God should terrify us. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8 and 28, and let's look at some stuff. Now, in my left-hand panel, we'll see this is based upon those that only love what we call the New Testament. I don't think I'm sharing my screen yet, so am I sharing it? Yeah, see, I need to share my screen. I want my screen to be able to be seen so that people can look at what I'm doing. So I click on my share screen and now we should be able to share all of our love together. Right here in Matthew chapter eight, verse number 28, the Messiah. The Messiah is on the earth at this time and Rome is ruling that part of the country. And the Bible says, and when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. I'm gonna make the print a little bigger for those that's watching with the Zoom. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Or thou come hither to torment us before the time. Here we are witnessing two individuals possessed with demons but that which is on the inside possessing them, they look at the son of the most high God and do you hear the terror in their voice? If you don't hear it in their voice, do you hear it in what they're saying? Are you coming to torment us, not just punish us, not banish us, are you come to torment us? We know that there is a time that you are going to torment us. And they said, are oh, you come to do it early? Are you early to torment us before the time? And instead of answering right away, the narrative says, and there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. And the devils or the demons besought him saying, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, go. And when they would come out, they went into the herd of swine and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Have a note, James 2 and 19. You see, I said the imposition of God should terrify us. We are human. We have corporal bodies, bodies that can be touched, they can be burnt, can be hit. Here are beings that don't have that kind of physicality. They have terror of the Most High God. We've been taught not to fear him, but to only respect him. In James chapter 2, verse 19, the scripture says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. 
What is our problem? Why is it that we don't tremble? Why is it we are not terrified of God? Have we been taught that he is so much love that there is nothing about him that is frightening? Have you ever walked into a plant where they make electricity? Have you ever been in a place where there's 450, I mean 440, up to 15,000 volts of electricity? Have you ever walked into a place where they are making molten steel? Have you ever walked around the side of the Niagara Falls and knowing that if you step on one of those rocks, you can slip and go down in there? How do I know? One day, many years ago, I was doing something at Niagara. I stepped on one of those rocks and that rock was like wet ice. I think I jumped and grabbed the ground and held it with all my strength. And I was able to get back up. I think I hurt my foot, but better my foot than lose my life. When an individual is working with electricity, or any heavy equipment, there's a certain amount of fear one should have. Yes, there's a respect, but believe me, there are principles of electricity. Your body is a conductor. It can kill you. It can maim you. You can drive a car and not fear that car. Go ahead and drive it like you normally do when it's sleet and ice in the snow, uh, on the ground in Georgia. When other people are driving the same way with no fear, when it comes to God most high, yes, we respect him, but the demons, they tremble. They don't want to be tormented. We act as if we'll never be tormented by him. It is that the way he describes himself? Is that the way he presents himself in the scripture? Let's look at Matthew chapter one, verse 24. I'm saying Mark 21 and 24. The book of Mark says, if I read 23, it says, and there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And again, the same kind of thing in Luke chapter 4 and 33. There was a man which had a spirit of an unclean, and he cried out, saying, let us alone, what are we to do with you? It's validated by Luke what was said in Mark. In Acts 16 and 16, the Bible says, after the Messiah had gone back up into heaven, yet he was still a person that we should be terrified by his impositions in our lives. Not just when you're doing righteously. Look at what it says here. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Soothsaying, you can come on and get it. Soothsaying is a practice of divination. And it says, in the same followed Paul and cried, saying, these men are servants of the most high God would show us a way of salvation. And this she did many days, but Paul being grieved turned and said to her, to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. After that, the masters lost much money. Two men, two men, listen to what happened. And the evil spirit answered and said, Tim, go read a little, just a little bit more so they can get it. That was, I mean, 13, now I'm in Acts 19, 13. That was certain of vagabond Jews, vagabond. What is a vagabond Jew? They go about from place to place. We might call them like gypsies. Jews, exorcists. They took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ saying, we adjure you, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. There were seven sons of Seba, a Jew, chief of their priests, which did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, in other words, jumped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. You can demand a demon to do anything you want to. You can declare and decree. You can speak against evil spirits and against dignities. What the book of Jude tells you not to speak evil against dignities. So much so it shows you that Michael the archangel did not bring a railing accusation against them. But he said the Lord rebuke you. But the demons are not terrified of you. They are not terrified of me. How much more then should a man be terrified of me? The Bible shows that when Paul preached the word of God, that terror, when it's preached right, should come into a man that's got his mind made that he's not going to follow God. In the book of Acts chapter 24, verse 25, the Bible says, and as he reasoned, who is he talking to? Tim, go back and read more. Read verse 24. And certain days when Felix came with Drusilla, which was a Jewish, not Jewish, I-S-S, Jewish, that means female. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. And he reasoned. In other words, he got a discourse. He gave him arguments of righteousness. Righteousness, what being right is before God, temperance, how to keep yourself in line with what the most I want, and judgment to come. Not God loves you, not God got a plan of salvation for you. He knows the plans that he has for you of good and not evil. It said he reasoned with him about righteousness, what God demands, what your duty is toward him, temperance. What it is you must do in order to constrain yourself to do what's righteousness and what the consequence of being disobedient to that is or the consequences of those that are disobedient for you to be righteous. He says, and the judgment to come, Felix trembled. Look at the word here. In Phobos, if you're looking on my page, down at the bottom, there it is. There's a sense of the word terrified to become terrified. In other words, whatever Paul preached, I need to learn how to preach it. And notice what he did and answered and said, go thy way for this time when I have convenient season. In other words, when I get the opportune time, I will call for thee. This man was hoping to get money. The terror did not last long enough for him to make a change. Only two more, only two more. In second address, E-S-D-R-A-S, I've already told you all before, the Catholic Church and evangelicals tell us not to use these books, yet they use them. Use them in commentaries, and we're, and we're not gonna act like we don't know what these books have to say to us. But in 2 Ezra 16 and 10, the Bible says he cast lightnings, talking about God, and who shall not fear? He shall thunder, and who shall not be afraid? The Lord shall threaten, and who shall not utterly be beaten into powder at his presence? This is the God of the scriptures. My last one that I'm going to read, just letting you know we should be terrified if we see that demons are, if we can see that a governmental official is. Who are we to just say that God is love and that God is mercy? The imposition of God should cause us to be terrified. We don't often see his impositions of his wonder as it is. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, for those that like the last book of the Bible, listen to what these people say. Uh, let's go 15 and 3, then 4. In 3, it says, and they sang the song of Moses, 
the servant of God and the song of the lamb. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous. We're gonna talk about his marvelous works and marvelous are thy words, Lord God almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints, who shall not fear thee. Look at the word down at the bottom of my right, on my left hand panel, phobia. Who shall not fear? It didn't say respect, it said who shall not fear and glorify thy name. For thou art only holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgment are made manifest. Tim, you might not have made a good case before you, but I want us to understand before we listen to what Mr. Elihu has to say, that the most high God does, he does want us to learn how to fear him. He does want us to be afraid. He does know what he's talking about. So as I had my wife to look this up, make sure I knew where it was, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. If I read all Hebrews 12, it will tell you that we have a great cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses are the people that suffered and they persevered in chapter 11. They are the cloud of witnesses. Then it tells you, but if you've seen them, let me show you something and someone better. Let's look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who the demons trembled after, who the demons, they would respect, they wouldn't respect another person. They respected Paul who had Jesus in him, but they didn't respect the seven sons of Siva, the one that the demons came out of the spirit of divination came out of that woman. The same Jesus that made Felix tremble, made him terrified. The same one that they sing about in the book of the Revelation that is overcome and all the nations should fear him. It says that one, he is the author and the finisher of our faith and who for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, the suffering, and he despised the shame. And now he is seated at the right hand of power, which is another term for using to co-reign with the Father. He said, but he endured contradiction of sinners against himself. But he said, you have not resisted on the blood. You have not gone that far. But he says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges, every son that he received, but then he says something amazing. He says, you have not come to the mountain that you see in Exodus 19 that was on fire, that was shaking, that was trembling, and the voice that the people couldn't stand to hear. But when you get to the end of that chapter, he makes a statement about a summation of the cloud of witnesses, who we are following, who he is, what he endured, what he will do, to his people, every son that he receives. Notice he says in Hebrews 12 and 28, we therefore receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby, in other words, let us have grace that will empower us. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, not like Cain, but like Abel, that we may serve God acceptably with reverence. There's your word reverence. Then it says and with godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. There's no joke right there. We've been playing around too much with the most high God. We just say, well, I'm going to just lay my religion down for a little bit. I'm going to just do this a little bit and do that a little bit. But I'm telling you now, what we have done is when you've lost the fear of the most high God, it's capable for you to do any and everything that ought not to be done. You can take his name in vain. You can serve another God. You can throw away his Sabbath. You can make images. You can disobey and be ungodly. The parents lie, steal, fornicate bear false witness covet because you don't fear God. You only say, I respect him. But when I respect him, I, I respect him and he respects me. Because people have told you God won't force you. 
to do his will. I used to hear a man say, God is a gentleman. Well, ask the 605,000 people that he killed in the wilderness. Maybe the man is meaning something else that he's not going to force you to do right. But uh, if he's not going to force me to do right, but going to going to light into me and execute his judgment on me, uh, I, I need more understanding what he means. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4 and 24. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 24, listen to what it says. For the Lord, for Yahweh, your Elohim, is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Does that sound like I'm jealous, I just want you to respect me. What was he talking about? Before then, he said, don't make graven images. I brought you up out of Egypt. In the first part of chapter four, I'm sending you out to the world to be the wisdom of the world so that they can learn from you how to serve me. And then he tells them in that 23rd verse, take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of Yahweh, your Elohim. He says, which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which Yahweh, your Elohim has forbidden thee. For the Lord, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire even a jealous God. He says, don't do it. He says, when you beget children and children's children and you have remained long in the land and forget or you corrupt yourself and make a graven image for the likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of Yahweh your God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. You shall soon utterly perish. That's the imposition of God. He is imposing his will. He is imposing his decree. He is imposing a morality. He is imposing restrictions on people. And when he imposes his restrictions on people, it should terrify you because with the imposition, of that decree, there's an imposition of a punishment if you don't listen. Listen to it again. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land where you go over into Jordan to possess it. You shall not, provoke, you shall not prolong your days upon it, but you shall be utterly destroyed. And Yahweh will scatter you among the nations Look at us, look at us, not just over in Africa no more. Look at us, not just in Israel no more. Look at us, Australia, look at us, Canada, look at us in the South America, North America, all over the world and despised all over the world. Heritage taken, but your blood type still there letting you know who you are. You're a haplo group. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve God or Elohim, the work of men's hand. You're going to be having different kind of holy days that you're going to be celebrating that's not yours. You're going to be celebrating Janus, the two-faced man, and calling it New Year's. You're going to be serving and celebrating Easter, Estore, and you're going to be doing the same thing with Swarte P, a black-looking demon that would be around with Santa Claus. What they beat Krampus. You're going to be doing the same thing, all other types of holidays, and you're going to be serving days of witchcraft, and you're going to be adding my name to it. You're going to be celebrating the dead. You're going to be celebrating immorality. Your children are going to be given over to be destroyed. There you shall serve God, the works of men, hands, wood, and stone. Sometimes you're going to even be in country where you kiss the stone, call it the cover. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a little emblem at the bottom of a woman's vagina, and you're going to be kissing on it. Yes. You're going to be going around the circle. You'll be walking around with a wooden cross or a metal cross as if that's representing my son with a dead person on it that's not even a Hebrew or an Israelite. You're going to be celebrating and bowing down the paintings of statues of Greeks, Romans. You don't feel 
that the imposition of God should terrify you? It says, which neither see, hear, nor smell. Well, the real question is, Tim, how in the world does that go and fit with the 37th chapter of the book of Job? Well, I'm going to show you. And if you feel like I didn't make a good fit, you can tell me. But I'm saying that Elihu, he came out with something that I think was good to see. Now, what I did was I opened two panels. On my left panel, that's the authorized version. On my right panel, that will be what we call the ESV. So let's listen to Elihu. Again, the imposition of God in our lives should terrify us. This is one of the ways when I talk to atheists or I talk to people that say they don't believe in God, that I show them. I look at what is, and I say, what has to be, what has to exist for what is to be what it is? And I just ask the person who makes the sun, why does the sun shine without our permission? We don't ask it to, it does it. The weather changes without our permission. Man is not making the sun shine. He can see clouds and bring rain, but he doesn't normally make it rain. He, he can make earthquakes, but he's not the one that makes the earthquake all of the time. He is not the one that makes our bodies dependent on oxygen. That's the imposition of the most high God showing us that he's in control, that he forces his will. He forces his systems upon us. Therefore, by him sitting and putting those impositions on us, we should begin to understand how terrifying he is because not only is he all powerful, not only is he all wise, that if he can impose upon us heat, rain, cold, snow, that we have to breathe, we have to rest, we have to sleep. How is it that we can't understand that he is the same one to impose upon us our morality? If he imposes the things that we see, why shouldn't we think he doesn't impose the things that we don't see? Well, Tim, I, well, that's a big jump. No, it's not. Can you see the air you breathe? Can you see the words that you speak? No, you don't. You see something written down. That's the instantiation of the word. Can you see the thoughts that you have to think? No. So we live in a world and we have con concrete things as well as abstractions. So let's let Elihu talk to Job. Job. 37, verse number one. Elihu says, at this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of its place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. I, I was teaching this class on Thursday and Elder Lane said he liked it when I read it in the ESV, so I'm gonna read from the ESV and I'll have it open on the left side in the authorized version. So let's go to verse three, the verse two again. He's talking to Job and the men that surround him. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumblings that come from his mouth. Under the whole heaven, he lets it go. And his lightning to the corners of the earth and after his voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice. And he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, to the downpour, his mighty downpour. Most of the time, we don't realize the power. We don't realize the power that's in the voice of God. So I'm going to go to Psalm 29 and just let you just get a taste of the power of the voice of the Most High God. Because we think that we should just reverence him. The imposition of God's thunder is not something we ask for. 
We don't ask for his lightning, neither can we stop it. But listen to what David says. David says in Psalm 29 and 1, give ear unto Yahweh, O ye mighty. Give unto Yahweh glory and strength. That don't mean you're going to make him strong. You give him of your glory and strength. You're not giving him glory and strength. Understand the way the man is talking. Give unto Yahweh glory due. That means you owe him his name. Worship Yahweh in the beauty of holiness in a sanctified way that you're not worshiping him with other gods simultaneously. Now listen, the voice of Yahweh is upon the waters. The glory of God thundereth. Yahweh is upon many waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh breaketh the cedars. You're talking about trees thicker than my body. The voice of Yahweh. If you understand anything about when he came down on Mount Sinai in the 19th chapter of Exodus when Moses was afraid, the voice of the Lord was roaring. We don't know what all was breaking up there. We know the people got scared and said, we don't want God to talk to us no more. Moses, you, in other words, Moses, you go up there. If anybody die, let it be you. We don't want to go. It says, yea, Yahweh breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them to skip like a calf. Imagine big cedars breaking and skipping down the hill. <laughs> Lebanon and Syria are like a young unicorn. The voice of Yahweh divided flames of fire. You know like those fires they have up there in uh, California? Just let the voice of the Lord Go, 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 and the flames gone. The voice of Yahweh shaketh the wilderness. Yahweh shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of Yahweh makes the hinds or make the deer, the deer, the female deer, the calf. It discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. I just wanted you to just get a taste of what Elihu is saying. Listen, after you've seen what the voice of the Lord is like, I want you to hear what Elihu is saying again. Let's go again to verse two. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice. Maybe you'll have a different idea when it says, and the Lord came to Adam and he heard the voice of the Lord in the cool of the day. Maybe you won't think it's no more that he's walking through the, the garden after Adam and Eve seen, saying, Adam, where are you? No. And he said, keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumblings that come out of his mouth under the whole heaven. He lets it go and his lightning to the corner of the earth. And after it, his voice roars and the thunders of his majestic voice. And he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice are heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, the downpour, his magic, his mighty downpour. What I really want you to understand is the imposition of God's sovereignty on the earth. At his word, snow comes. At his word, he thunders. At his word, lightning comes. At his word, he does what he wants to. Will you not fear anyone that can impose that on you? I remember as a child making noise that they should shut that racket up in there. Shut that fuss up, F U S S. Shut that fuss up in there. Am I right, Gary? Sometimes a little children start screaming, the parents. Give them alcohol to make them be quiet. Yeah, they will. Sometimes they put their hand over their mouth. Who's going to put their hand over God's mouth? The imposition of God is letting you know who he is. Letting you know who you're not. We should be terrified at the imposition of God most high and be thankful 
and be thankful that we have a days man and be thankful that we have a mediator betwixt us, but ever, don't ever get it twisted because that same one says the father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment to the son. He is the one that said, I will say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. He is the one to say, if you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love. He said, even as I kept my father's in abide in his love, you must understand that if you're in his love and if you're in him, yes, he was still chasing, it's still terrifying, but the damnation that's going to come on others should not come on you, but never take him lightly. Peter saw him one day and Peter knew his stuff. He's a professional. Had a professional voice. Had his own equipment. Had his own transportation. And here comes Messiah. Got anything in there to eat? No, he ain't caught nothing. Throw your net over there on the right side. Look, master. I know you know that God stuff. You're a great teacher. But we've been out here all night. And you, the son of a carpenter. We've been out here all night. We know how to do this. But you know what? At your word, I'm going to let you impose your will on me. Threw his net out there. Caught so many fish. The net was about to break. Now, I don't know what they were getting for fish then. But if one fish is enough to feed a family, they'll just say, I know when I go to the farmer's market, some fish about that big, you might pay 20 something dollars for it, okay? Depending on what it is. I'm just saying the whole fish, because they wouldn't have been filleted coming out of the water. I'm saying, I'm saying how long, not the thickness, the length. Thickness may be like that, I'm sorry, Gary. But what I'm saying is that might have been enough to give him enough money for two or three months or more. And the net start to break. And what did he do? He realized something. And he says, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Because they are positioned. And realizing who he was, if you don't think the imposition of God could cause terror, do you think Isaiah was stupid in Isaiah chapter 6 when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train filled the temple and the smoke was going in and he said, whoa, it's me. He ain't even saying because I've seen the spirit for five or six things that could have skipped me. I've seen the most high. Woe is me. When Joshua saw him in that fifth chapter, I believe it's the fifth chapter of Joshua, not the seventh. It is the fifth. It's the fifth. Seventh is Achan. And when he saw him, he didn't fear at first. He was concerned. But when he knew who he was, fall down to his face. The imposition of God most high is something we shouldn't take lightly. The imposition of God is that when he interacts in this world, it's a condescension for us. He does not need us. He can destroy us. If the finger of God can cast out devils, if the finger of God can write on stone, if the finger of God can cause Pharaoh's people to tremble. What about his whole being? So Elihu, when he's speaking like this, don't take what he's saying as weakness. So he says, for to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Snow, come down. Downpour, come down. And when I say the imposition of God's sovereignty, listen to, listen to what God does when he imposes that. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55 and 10. When the Most High makes his rain come down, it says in Isaiah 55 and 10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, which is God's imposition on the earth. We're not making it happen. You can't stop it. He's imposing that. And return if not hither, but it waters the earth. Why? Because God imposes that on the earth. What if we had to water the whole earth for ourselves? Had to go to the ocean, pipe it the way we want to go. What would they charge us? What they charge for the little piece of water right here in this little bottle? 
It says, and make it that bring forth bud. Look at that. Make it that that's his imposition. That's his providential care for us. Make it that bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. If you can see the imposition of God doing those things to build you up, why can't you see verse 11? So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing where to I sent it. If my word is to build you up, if my word is to save you, Jeremiah, if my word in your mouth is to tear down, to plug up, to cast down, to build up and plant. My word will not go out void. And when I say Jeremiah, Jerusalem will be destroyed, it will be. When I say through my prophet David, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all of the nations that forget God, just like my rain comes down and water the earth and it gives blood so that you have food to eat. When my word comes down and it talks about judgment, realize judgment will come so that the righteous can have vindication and so that they can see that I am their sovereign. God and that I will impose justice and peace in the land. The imposition of God should terrify us. It should bring us joy if we're following him. But it should never be that we get to the place that we get too comfortable with him. There was a man named Moses and he still is named Moses. One time the Lord told him to hit a rock. Water came out. The next time he said, talk to the rock. Just speak to it. People got on Moses' nerves. Moses said to Aaron, must we fetch water out of this rock, ye rebels? Most high God did not let him go into the promised land because of that. He said, because you didn't sanctify my name. And then Moses kept asking, he said, don't ask me about that no more. Do you think Moses feared to ask again? I would. We have the tendency to think that God is our good buddy because he's a father. We have the tendency to think that we're on equal basis with him because of the son. We have the tendency to feel like I won't serve a God that I got to be afraid of. You won't. You serve a government that you're afraid of. They show you enough commercials on TV. You'll do anything. You'll inject stuff inside of your body. You don't know what it is. You will go and you will stay at home. You will do things to your children. You'll make your children do things. You'll You'll do all kinds of things. They'll say something and you'll go buy a bottle of toilet paper and milk and bread just because you hear it on the news. But when God gives you something through his word, well, you know, it ain't going to be that bad. Oh. Listen to what he says in Amos chapter 4, verse 7. The Most High says, and I also withholding the rain from you. If we don't start seeing that God imposes his will throughout these scriptures, Imagine you, you, you making your living farming and the most high imposes drought on you. All your stuff has been planting and nothing's growing. He says, I also, it didn't just happen. I also have told the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. Three, look, 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 look. Three months and it's time to get paid. You're already counting your money. You already count now, you're going to build it up. I probably let it start budding and looking good. And three months before the harvest, I let it start raining. Then he says, and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another. One piece was rained upon and the other piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered to a, one city to drink water but they were not satisfied. In other words, I make you all go and share the same water so it's not enough for either one of you. <laughs> Yet, you have not been terrified. Yet, you have not been scared. 
Yet you have not returned unto me, saith Yahweh. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increase, guess what? I sent the palm of worms. I'm in Amos chapter 4, verse 9. I'm sorry. 4 and 9. The palm of worm devoured them. Yet you were not terrified of me. Yet you returned not to me, saith the Lord. Again, I started that with the rain because I was building upon the rain because that's what Elihu was saying about the rain. And I started at Amos 4 and 7 where he said he is withholding the rain. Let's go to Ezekiel and look at one more witness. See, all this is said after Elihu. How did Elihu know these things? I say in the same way Noah knew what would do what, what was right with God and Abram knew what to do. That was God has a God had a covenant, had his law before he ever wrote them in stone. In Ezekiel 13 and 11, the Bible says, and this is talking about the wicked. Tim, read verse number 10, because we know we want peace. Ezekiel 13 and 10. Because even when they have seduced my people saying peace, when there was no peace. In other words, please understand how I'm framing this. Judah's getting ready to be destroyed. And you got people that are saying, they're declaring, they're decreeing that there's going to be peace. But when you don't fear the most high God, there are times when he'll come in and impose his will over your will to let you know your will is a contingent will. His is an independent will. And so he says, you have seduced my people saying peace when there was no peace. And one built up a wall for protection and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. In other words, not a strong joint. Say unto them, which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower. What? I'm going to send enough rain that I'm going to destroy it. And ye, O great hailstones, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rent it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, it shall not be said of you, where's the daubing? For you have daubed it. Will you not be terrified of a God that can take your plans, your well plans, and your job that you can do that other people accept and show you up that you wasn't who you would say you say you were? And this is not just talking about a wall you are. This is talking about your lives. This is talking about how you're going to live in peace. And that you got all these smooth words and these positive affirmations that you write on the refrigerator. All these positive affirmations that you stick on the wall are uh, your daytime and your seven year goal and your five year goal and your three year goal. And the most high God said, You think this is going to give you peace? Oh, well, Tim, sometimes they work, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But ultimately, you got to meet this one. And so when Elihu is saying that he trembled and he's drawing a picture to Job. He's trying to show Job, Job, I need you to understand this is what I see in the greatness of God. I tremble. I'm terrified. I look at the things that he imposes upon the earth, and I, and I start feeling a wonder. Look at what he says in verse 7. I'm back in Job 37. It says, let me open this one back on this side for people. He seals up the hand of every man that all men whom he has made may know it. Now, I had to work on that one, but guess what? I call that the, that the imposition of limitation. What do you mean, Tim? Let me show you. When the most high determines there's certain things he's going to do, he can stop individuals from going out and doing the things that they want to do. Let me show you. Verse 8 will help you see it. 8 and 9. The beasts go into their liars, or the beasts go into their dens and remain in their dens. From its chambers come the whirlwind and the cold and the scattering wind. In other words, 
the most I can impose his weather in such a way that it's too cold for the animals to be out. He can send the rain when it's too much for them to come out. And they go and find themselves a shelter, a place of safety. This is the imposition of God. That I can stop your commerce. I can stop the animals from coming and going. I've seen animals leave when they show the thing when the tsunami is coming. And the animals realize before the people and the animals will be leaving in droves out of that area, going somewhere else. Do you think that's not an imposition for them to leave their home? Do you think that's not an imposition for them to leave their sacred place? And here they all going, the ones that don't even like each other, but they, we got to get away. Bible says the beasts going to their lives, it can get so cold, it can get so wet, we can't go outside. Sometimes, like when the hurricanes come, some people say they're going to sit through it. I don't see a lot of them out there, that 140 uh, wind and that rain walking around and skipping. You might see one or two, but where's the, where's the majority? They're either gone or they what they call hunkered down. That's something they say down here in the South. But listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 135 and 7 about God's snow, his rain, and how he imposes it. In Psalms 135, verse 7, it says, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth his wind out of his treasuries. In other words, what you begin to understand, it's not just happening. Do you not fear the awesomeness of someone that does that at his own will? Whether you say the unsaved. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13 says somewhat the same thing. He says, when he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heaven and he calls his vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning with rain. He brings forth his winds out of his treasures, almost as if he's saying the exact same thing. But what we get to see is, is that he can seal your hand. He can stop you from doing things that you want to do. Look at seven again. He seals up the hand of every man that all men whom he made may know it that you are subject. The beasts go into their lives. They remain in their dens. From his chamber come the whirlwind, the cold, and the scattering winds. When the Most High takes that same rain, that same vapor, he can send it down cold as snow. He can send it down as ice. He sends his winds, and they can't stop his wind. Listen to verse 10. By the breath of God, ice is given. And the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick clouds with moisture and the clouds scatter his lightning. They turn about and around by his guidance. That guidance, that word here, look at that word. That I, I, I highlight that word and it's tabula. That word is a word like navigation, like a ship. The most high, the clouds, when they move and the lightning and whatever moves around, it says he does it by his guidance. Uh, King King James, let's say, how would King James say that? Let me go over here to verse 12. You got to go back to that book. It says, and he turns about by his counsel, okay? So you might miss that. It's the same Hebrew word up under there, see? The same Hebrew word. It's just a different surface word. But he does that by his guidance. Then it says, why does he do that? To accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable word, world. My, now my question is this, do you think that if you saw God right now in his essence, you'd be just like this. Hi God, hi Yahweh, glad to meet you. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, isn't it? It's a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be my neighbor? We have no full clue of what it would be like to see him. When they've seen the sun, it caused fear. When Moses saw the back, when the demons saw him, 
They were afraid. The Bible says the demons that have already seen him, they trembled. We don't. When they veiled him, that was one thing. When they saw him without the veil on the Mount of Transfiguration, the 17th chapter, Peter said, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. The Bible said he didn't know what to say. That's the time you can become dis discombobulated. But then that voice spoke. This is my beloved son. Hear him. So it says he guides them and it accomplishes all that he wants it to do on the habitable world. Going back to what we saw in Isaiah, I believe 55, his word does the same thing. He has different ages that he guides his word through so that it will accomplish what he wants it to accomplish for some vindication and for some damnation. 13, whether, listen, whether for correction or his land, or for love, he causes it to happen. I like the way it says it in King James. Listen, for he causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land for mercy. Let's, let's get back to the context. It says, by his breath, frost is given. By his breath, waters are straightened. By the watering, he wearied the cloud. He scatters his bright cloud and is turned about by his counsel that they may do whatsoever he commanded them upon the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction. Remember the flood in Noah's day? It's not the only time he's used water for correction or his land for mercy. Should we not tremble? If you knew you were gonna meet him today, what could you do to be prepared? Verse number 15, hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know how God lays command upon them? Do you? I've told you how awesome his works are. Now I want to know, do you know how he lays his command on the cloud, the rain, the snow? Do you? I mean, do you understand how? I'm telling you that. Do you know how? And causes the lightning of his, of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancing of the clouds, Job? Do, do you know? Or the wondrous works of him that is perfect in knowledge? Job, do you understand how perfect the knowledge of the Most High is? They didn't call it the water cycle then, but he described it. Do you know how perfect his knowledge is? Is your knowledge that perfect, Joe? You say you want to meet with him. You say you want to argue your case before him. Okay, Joe, I've shown you his power. Joe, I've shown you how terrible he is. Joe, I've shown you that. But now I'm just saying, do you understand how he does these things right here that we see a lot? Okay, let, let's look a little bit. He says, he says, who's, you whose garment are hot, you whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. Can you spread out the skies hard as a cast metal mirror? Let, 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 let me show you what's going on here. He says, how your garments are warm when they quieted by the south wind. A lot of times the south wind is not mentioned like that. Sometimes it used east wind, but let me show you something about the south wind, okay? I pulled this up out of um, Nikot. This is a commentary, and it's, um, it's, I think it's New International Commentary of the Old Testament. But anyway, it talks about that south wind. It's called a Sirocco. We talked about that years ago. It says, when the Sirocco, a south wind, blows off the desert, village life comes to a standstill. The land becomes there, the land becomes still, and every creature seeks shelter under some shade. The silence can be felt. People become listless and irritable. Clothing becomes unbearably hot. Everyone feels as though he is suffocating. On such a day, the sky is such a bold blue that it looks as hard as a molten mirror. Elihu asked Job if he could assist God in spreading it out. 
literally hammering it out, the solid sky, especially on such a hot day when he is so robbed of strength that he does not want to do anything. Of course not. The picture makes it clear that God is the mighty one. I, I, I like this so much. I said, I want to get it to you. Now, let, let's look at what Jesus says about that. In Luke chapter 12, verse 54, Jesus says, and he said unto the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when you see a south wind blow, there will be heat and it comes to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it you cannot discern this time? That wind was of such that people would know what's getting ready to happen. Now, if the wind coming, you can know what's happening. How much more when you can see the wondrous acts of the Most High God that you can't fear that something is about to happen, either for correction or for mercy, but that he's acting and it's above something that you can control. It's the imposition of the Most High God. Can you not see that your place is not above, but is beneath? Oh, but we feel too much about ourselves. We, we think too highly of ourselves. But there's one other thing I wanted to talk about on that. I want to talk about the climatological phenomena that he describes. Climatological. Yeah. I had to syllabicate it. I don't use that word much. He, he describes indigenous to Palestine where the west wind would bring inland moisture from the Mediterranean and the south wind would bring heat from the Negev desert, a furnace blast of desert air common in late spring that can raise the temperature 30 degrees in an hour. That's, that's, what, I wanted to, that's what I wanted you to see. 30 degrees in an hour. I, it doesn't even, it look, if it's 10 degrees somewhere and you raise it 30, the people will like it. But in the days in Georgia, when it's already 90, and you go to 120, up it's 98, it can rent in one hour. It says Jesus castigates his audience for being able to read these signs, but unable to read the present time. So when I'm saying what Elihu is saying, Elihu is not just talking stuff. Elihu actually knows some things that's going on at that time. And I thought it would be good to just let you all see some of what I looked at. All right, now, again, let's go back to what he said. Do you know the balancing of the cloud? I'm in verse 16. And the wondrous works of him that is perfect in knowledge. You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. He said, you can't do nothing about it, nothing. You sit there and just hope that it gets over with. He said, can you, like, can you spread out the sky hard like a, me like a metal mirror? Teach us what we shall say to him. Job, Job, he makes it rain. He makes the snow. He spreads out the earth. He sends the heat. He makes the thunder. He makes the lightning. He, he, Job, do you know where he keeps his stuff? Okay, he's perfect in knowledge and you're not. He's all powerful and you're not. Job, would you teach us what to say then if we get to go before him? Teach us, if Ellie was like, ah, really? Teach us what to say. Teach us what to say. Cause he says, teach us what to say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. Let me read it over here. We cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Shall it be told him that I would speak? Did ever a man wish that he would speak and be swallowed up? In other words, shall it be told God, Yahweh, what I should speak? If a man speak, surely he will be swallowed up. Now the word here to be swallowed up is yebula. Okay? That's a word that is used often to show 
confusion. Let, let, me, let me show you. I got a couple of places where it is, but listen, Bula, and they say Bula in this, where I copied it. It means where it says to swallow up. It may mean to be confused, confounded, described as confused mental state under the influence of too much wine. It describes the dissolution or the solution of carefully formed plan. Let, let's take a look at it in the context. He said, Joe, can you tell, so what can we say, Joe? Teach me what to say. Because I don't know what to say. Show us how to order our speech to make a case before God. Because it's dark, we don't know how he does the clouds. We don't know how he does the lightning. We don't know how he does the rain. We know that. We don't know how. So please tell us what we should say if we would go before him. And he said, if I be told what to speak, I believe I'm going to be swallowed up. Or man would be swallowed up because we don't know enough. This is what, this is what the man, I believe, is intimating. So in Isaiah 28 and 7, listen to this one. But they have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up with wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision and stumble in judgment. He's saying, what am I going to say? Because of the reason of the darkness, I don't understand what he's doing. I don't understand how he's doing it. And therefore, you're going to tell because other than that, I'm going to be swallowed up. You'll be swallowed up going before him. You got too much that you don't know about what you don't know when you know what you do know, that you don't know how much you don't know. Let me give you a picture. This little bitty spot, let me do it on my face, on my face. If I knew everything about that little spot on my face, what about the rest of my face? What about my eyes? What about my nose? What's, about, what's behind that spot? That's like taking a bulletin board and you make a, a circle this big on the side. If you know everything about this much in the world and the rest of the bulletin board is still vacant, look at what you don't know. You see? And I don't even, and, I, and, and the thing is, is that this is the picture that Elihu was drawing. And it showed that the priests have erred through strong drink, and it lets you know how they are failing. Look at what it says in Isaiah 3 and 12. This is a good one. And it says, that's for my people. Children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. Men, when women rule over you, that's a sign of a curse. That's a sign of folly that women ruling over you. And when you're supposed to rule over women, you aren't supposed to do it like God said. The Bible said he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of Yah. You don't go ruling over somebody because you got a penis and you think you can just beat them upside the head, kick them in the rump, slap them around, cuss them out because you got a dang God penis. What's wrong with you? It can be cut off. You can die. It ain't all of that. Because your muscles are big. It ain't all of that. And the converse is true. Just because you feminist and you got a vagina, that don't mean you rule the world. No, we got one ruler. It is God. He sets the pattern. Just like he says, the rain, it waters the earth. He sends his word and it waters the people and give them life eternal from the everlasting water. He says the order. We don't know who he is. Feel like saying dead gummit, but I'm not going to say it. And it says women rule over them. Oh, my people, they which cause thee to err and destroy they which lead thee, cause thee to error and destroy. That's that word swallow and destroy the way of thy path. Now you see what Elihu was saying. Elihu said, Job, you really, you, you teach us what to say, but by reason of darkness, we're going to be swallowed up. We don't know which way to go. We don't know how to do. I'll give you one more, Psalm 55 and 9, the chief musician. The Nigma. This is the masculine Psalm of David. Go down here to verse nine. Destroy, O Yahweh, 
and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. What is this about? So that the Most High will confuse the people so that they cannot accomplish their goals. What's the context when we're looking at this? Go back to the 19th verse of chapter 37. Elihu says, teach us what we shall say unto him. Joe, you want to meet him? Teach us what we shall say. It says, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. He already proved his darkness before he got to that cloth. Shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speaks, surely he shall be swallowed up. In other words, he'll be confused. And now men see not the bright light, which is in his cloud, but the wind passes and cleanses them. Now, let me read that in 21 because 22 got something I need you to see. It says that now no one looks on the light when it's bright in the sky, when the wind has passed and cleared them. Out of the north come golden splendor. It is clothed with awesome majesty. Now, King James says, fair weather come out of the north. I don't know how they got that because the Hebrew word here is Zahab. Zahab is the word for gold, okay? I don't know what they did, how they did it. Gold. And it's believed to be the what they call like Aurora Borealis, those the lights from the sky like that. That's what they believe. Dr. Henry Morris talked about stuff like that. He He's a scientist and was just saying that, that kind of stuff. He wasn't talking about gold dropping down and maybe that's why they said fair weather. So in ESV, it says, out of the north comes golden splendor. See, God is clothed with awesome majesty. But in KJV, it says fair weather cometh out of the north. And with God is terrible majesty. So you can see it's still talking about the majesty. Uh, I don't, I still don't know about the fair and I ain't gonna try to fix it. Uh, I, I gotta leave that alone. Verse 23, touching the almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. Again, let me read it in ESV, the almighty, we cannot find him, he is great in power. Justice and upon abundant righteousness, he will not violate. I prefer violate as opposed to afflict. You see that word violate, yeah, it means to be wretched, to be emaciated, cringe. These are just some of the glosses. But the afflict, that would contradict what he does do with qualifier. You could say he don't afflict somebody to damnation, but he'll afflict the righteous. This is what this whole book is about. So it would look like Elihu is just lied if we didn't look behind that, violate. Now, Job could feel he was violated, but remember, there's a scripture that says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. So when you belong to the most, he can do whatever he wants to to you. And if the person don't like me saying that, they still don't get to change it. Verse number four, therefore men fear him. The word Yaru, we get Yare, fear, not just respect. Therefore men refer, they fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. Let me read it in this one too. Men therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. You see when it says wise of heart, context, context, context. So let's look at this last part as we finish. He's made these statements. Job, you seen how majestic this God is? He, first, he did weather, he did clouds, he did thunder, he did lightning, he did rain, he did snow in any storm. Saying, now, do you know how he does it? Do you know how he holds up the cloud? Then he comes back and say, you know what? He's imposed all these things on us and you want to talk to him. You're coming in there in darkness. What are you going to say? How are you going to say it? If you don't know enough about these things, how are you going to know about the other? Somebody said, Tim, I don't see where he got that from. 
those of us that have read it before, we know that the most tie takes it way deeper than that. You asked, the Elihu might ask him a couple of things that you don't know, but the most high got a list and it's not even exhaustive what he gave him. But listen to what I think it's important to see how Elihu laid that case out. In Job chapter nine, verse one, listen. Then Job answered and said, I know of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. I'm gonna to go to ESV. Come on. I wanna go back, to, I wanna to go to ESV because uh, Elder Lane said he, he could understand it better. So give me a second, Job nine. All right. It says, how can, I'm in verse two. How can man be right before God if one wished to contend with him? Or one could not answer him once. What happened to my thing? Somebody's talking on the conference. I need whoever it is on the conference line to mute their phone, please. It says, he is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. This is Job talking because he wants to have a case with God. And he said, so who has hardened himself against God and succeeded? I mean, succeeded. He who removes mountains, they know it not. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of his place, his pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise. He seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heaven and trampled the waves of the sea. He made the barren Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the earth, who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Behold, he passes by me. I see him not. He moves on. I do not perceive him. He snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? God will not turn back his anger beneath him, bow to help us of Rahab. How then can I answer him choosing my words with him? Though I am right, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I summon him and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with the tempest and multiply my wounds without cause. You see, a lot of what Elihu is saying, he's speaking of God's greatness, but he's still wanting to meet with God. And Elihu is, I've heard you, but what are you going to say? And you almost hear Job saying the same thing. Listen again to verse 12, 16. If I summon him and he answered me, I wouldn't believe I was, he was listening to my voice. He crushes me with the temple and a tempest and multiply my wounds without cause. He will not let me get my breath, but fills me with bitterness. If it is a contest of strength, I give. Behold, he is mighty. If it's a matter of justice, who can give him papers and summons him? Though I am right, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. I am blameless. I regard not myself, I loathe my life. It is all one, therefore I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given to the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of his judges. If it is not he, who then is it? Job and Elihu in many ways are saying the same thing. But Elihu is not going through it. We can be theologically sound and right. Let the day come that you lose a loved one. Let the day come when you're sick and can't get up. Let the day come when your income is taken because of a lie. Let the day come your family is dismantled. These things we can know. But as we walk through, the Bible speaks to the Messiah and say, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Job is saying, 
if God condemns me, I'm still condemned. But I know I'm innocent based upon what revelation that I have. I'm righteous. And I believe that the most I agreed with Job. I can show you in 42 and 7. But at the same time, he also know there's some things that you didn't know that was above your pay grade. I'm not charging you for wickedness for that because I hadn't revealed it to you. See how sweet he is? I've given you enough for salvation. I've given you enough to glorify my name. I've given you enough to be an aid and a light to the dim and the dark. But Job, I'm still terrible. I'm terrible. The imposition of even this on you lets you know you should be terrified of me. You should love me and be terrified of me at the same time. You should not want to violate me. You should not want to take me for granted. You should love my terror when you know that your enemies are getting about this close to my day of judgment. Someone say that, Tim, how can I be terrified of God and love him? You love God. You love the most high when you're terrified of him because of the fact he is always just. He is always righteous. He always imposes that on us. And that this world is not, is not our home yet. We are pilgrims. And in his awesomeness, he can take us through anything he wants to. It can be, it can make you fear and shake as Moses. You could be a son out in the garden crying with great tears, crying to the one that can deliver you. And you may end up having to say, not my will, but thine. But with the humiliation and with the suffering, it looks like there is a co-equal in proportion to the suffering, an exaltation that comes with it. Our greatest fear of the most high God should be that we think that we know everything about him. We know that which he tells us and some of the things he tells us he doesn't exhaust, but we can speak meaningfully of him. But the imposition of the Most High God is terrifying when you see him as he is. We should not want to go against him. We should always want that terror and power to be something that we have access to for his glory. But never just think he loves you. Never just think he just wants to be feared, I mean respected. Never just think he just wants to show mercy. All of his attributes are fully perfect and complete. The opposition of God should terrify us, especially those of us who know that often we step out of the way. And I'm not even talking about fornicating or adultery. You can just accuse somebody wrongly. You, you, you're the last person to walk out of that room in there. No, you're not the last. You've got two people. You walk out, you don't see the other one come out. Then you see them come out, you come back, something that was missing, it was in there. And you say, I know I did, he had to do it. But you never saw somebody coming in the other door, you've accused that person incorrectly. Could you imagine you're doing that and, and the most high God stands in the midst and say, did you see him take it? No, sir. How do you know he took it? I was in there with him. Did you see if anybody else came in there? What I'm saying is we ought to really learn to fear and tremble at his power, his perfect knowledge, and rejoice in his love for us and his compassion that he sent his son. But never forget the balance. With great power, there's great danger. I've shown you that with electricity. I got a friend, his name Dr. Marshall Williams. It's the last story. He told me the other day, 
he had to go up to Maryland and do a job. He was told that the weather was going to be okay. Everything was okay. It was a traffic jam for about 50 miles, but he'd be okay. So he had two, what they call pups, you know, like two trailers on the back. He said it was snowing and ice and he couldn't turn around or anything. And he's going like up and down this mountain. He said it took 10 hours to go 50 miles with that truck on there. He said it's just by the grace of God that he made it. That truck has a lot of power. There's a lot of danger. Not just danger, you driving it, but you got other people that, if they could do that, our lives are like that. When we're with God, when we're with the Most High, there's a lot of danger that's in our lives. The more we learn, the more we know, the more that is given to us, the more responsibility we have. Am I correct? To whom much is given, much is required. So let's start thinking more about the imposition of the most high God and realize that is truly one of the ways that we are able to let people know we don't run anything, that there is, that there is someone and we call him Yahweh most high, the most high Yahweh, Yahweh. We call him by his name in as much as we know that he imposes everything on here that we see. There's no big jump to understand he imposes his righteousness and justice as well. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the argument of Elihu. To show your power, show your majesty, and to show even if we can see that, when we start to think of how, we become swallowed up. Help us to realize that everything that you do and you impose upon us is going to accomplish your goal. Help us to grow in you and see you as the sovereign Lord of the universe. Amen, amen, and amen. We can now have discussion if anyone would like to have discussion. And if no one would like to have discussion, I can still be your friend. Oh, hi, Pastor Tim. How, How are you everybody doing? today? Doing well, and uh, you, Elder Lane? Very, very, very interesting topic. You brought everything in, especially the introductory of the responsibilities to Christ. And uh, I'm stepping out. I'm at a funeral, but I, I've been listening the whole time. And uh, I had to step out to let you know that I'm here with you. Uh, it's very interesting. And... Uh, Elihu and Job are finally winding down to where you're going to see things turn around. And, uh, but I stepped away from my family right quick to let you know that I'm here. It's beautiful and uh, it's, a, it's a great lesson, great topic. And I do hope somebody has some illustrations to put on. You know, but you covered it so well until it's going to be hard to you know, stick a hole in it. <laughs> You know, it's going to be hard. So, but anyway, it was great. And it's bringing it to the point to where, you know, Job and uh, Elihu are going to come to, the, you know, going to come to the foundation and people are going to see the truth. Going to see the truth where God is truly going to turn things around for Job. And Elihu. For joining us and we appreciate you. And you stay safe out there, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I got to get back on the road in the morning. I got to get back to Atlanta. Uh, so, but I, it's a friend of mine. You know, we've been close for years. My sister passed day after Christmas. And uh, I didn't know the funeral was going to be the day because I was supposed to leave uh, Thursday. But since the funeral was going to be Saturday, I just stayed over a couple more days. But uh, I want y'all to know I'm here. I'm listening. Man, it's, it's great and it's beautiful, you know. So, 
uh, all you guys that's in the sound of my boss, let Pastor Tim know he's doing a great job. Comment, speak out. Let him know he's teaching us something. You know, don't just sit there silent because God, he want us to be open and to speak out. Again, and we appreciate you, okay? Yes, sir. I hear you. Speak up, please. I can. Go ahead. I enjoyed the message. I just want to say when you're talking about the imposement of God on to, you know, the, the thundering and the lightning and that, that's nothing that we can do about that. That is true. I think people get the notion that just because God don't deal with you right away, that you think you're getting by. But the Bible says God is not mocked, nor is he deceived. And so that's why you got people that do evil and all kinds of things. Nothing happens to you them right away. And there's going to come a time that when you do such a thing, you all not only reap, right? You know, you're about to say, but I'm a man, so that he should also reap. And so, what a, a good message with uh, Peter who went. So, the Bible speaks about the goodness of God to lead a man to repent. Mm -hmm. Even when we were yet sinners, God still had mercy upon us. Yes. You know, I remember driving drunk, don't even know how I got home. Oh. And I had no love for God, but He still had mercy upon us. And so I think oftentimes when we don't see the ground, we feel like, or people feel like they're getting by. And so I just wanted to come in on that, that, that God, He got a time and a place for everybody that does. We, you're, not, you're not getting by. It's just a matter of time before you see the call. And so that would be my uh, message to say that. Say people know that you're not getting by. Amen. Well, thank you so much. All right, when I was going through it, I was thinking, it's like, how did that just jump in my mind, the imposition of God? But I, I just kept seeing him. <clears throat> Ellie, who kept saying, look what he does. Look what he does. Because many things we've gone through that have helped us grow. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't allow myself to be picked on as a child. I wouldn't allow myself to be feel hurt. I'd have been impervious to certain things. But you need that. They're like those guys that forced themselves to do push-ups on their knuckles. I was watching a guy the other day. They would they beat the sand with their fingers. They call it a shell and priest. They beat the sand with their fingers. Then they start beating trees with their fingers so they can make dents in the trees. Then they could take their fingers and do push-ups on their fingers and sit like that and do it. And, and then if they hit a person with that, they can do stuff. That how they're supposed to make them close to God. Like that Tutsuro commercial, the world may never know. <laughs> Anything, young man? Anything, young man? I think you've given a clear, um, obvious exposition and bringing me examples. I don't really feel like I have okay. anything to add, but I did think of something. <laughs> One of person, I'm gonna use a person because I'm a person, and I'm not talking about me. When a teacher gives a test, mm -hmm. they know how to check, and they know more than the boy checking the test. Most that's generally how it is. I mean, 
where you need to be tested, and knowing also the things that you don't know what you should know. But we consider the creator who was, I mean, he says the son is wisdom, righteousness, and power. I think sanctification. So he's, I, he says, I am. It's perspective. I keep saying perspective, and we have to, I have to be reminded. So if, if the one who gives the test knows what you need, I have students tell me sometimes, they're asking questions. And I sometimes the questions are, they're absurd. Or sometimes I'm like, you, you're not thinking about this. A lot of times my question, if you can gather with it, what person I'm coming from, if it's, I didn't want to, or I just misunderstood, there's a lot of valid questions. But some of them like, you really should ask that. Like, Maybe the question is, are we going to do anything important today? <laughs> you know, and you're the teacher. Yeah. I mean, Can you imagine getting a, a, a validate, whatever they call it, when they give you all the evaluation? Well, there are certain days the teacher say, we're just not going to do anything important. Can, can I get a refund for those days? And <laughs> looking at it, it's, it's So he's not gonna put more in you than you can bear in charisma. Right. And sometimes that 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 scripture without perspective, it don't it don't seem like that's true. <laughs> it don't seem like that's true. And I used to read it because there's a poem saying you make a way for you to escape. I'm like, well, what does escape mean? Well, does escape you know escape it? Does escape mean that you can go through it? It's like I think endurance is that. So when we're hitting him and remember what his son endured, it's like perspective. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a little bit of what, what I thought. I really like how you think he's here. Thank you. You can't see him. But the whole, the whole of the Lord can't see him. But the fact that he said, I think you can come boldly before the throne. I mean, bold is an interesting word, but it's like, you better understand how I mean that. Because you recognize me, who I am, and this is a privilege. Don't ever assume upon, presume upon my privilege, but if you come in the right way, you can come boldly and you can ask. Mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm putting verses together, but it, it, it was a good message uh, and to be reminded because we will still, I, I, I was looking at Malachi 1, I think he said, where's my fear? He said, you know, the, uh, you honor your father, you honor, I can't remember if he says the job, but he said, where's my fear? And I think people will relegate that to that up the word honor, but it's like, no, I mean, we will rob from God. And even the parable, I mean, when you see the the when they send the son out, these people know they don't own no land. And they're gonna say, we'll kill him. And, and I think just in, in general, we will like we, we didn't determine when we was gonna get here, we don't determine how long we're gonna breathe, and it would be like trying to instruct God. But you know, so I, I still don't think I've added much. But it's, it's perspective, and I say this: I need this perspective every day. <laughs> when things go well, when they according to how we feel, when things not go well, sometimes we think things are going well, and it's not. That's the truth. So I learned you better qualify with the Lord's word. You better qualify with that. And, and you said, I think several times, not to be complacent. That's true. So. We start saying we're not supposed to fear. Why? Because they told us not to. Why is that? I mean, it just... <laughs> so my 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 question to you all is: my my thesis was that we should be terrified of the Most High. Was that harsh? 
Thank you. May I explain, please? The Lord didn't mean it sweet. It depends on how you look at it. Some people look at it and say that's harsh and shit. But if you take if you take the fierceness out of terror, then it's, I don't think it is. So I think it depends on how you look at it. Okay. He said it's a consuming fire. Fire. That that's what say warn the people against I don't remember where it is. Yeah, warn the people from me, told them that in Ezekiel. Yeah. He didn't say from Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar just one of my soldiers. But the thing is, is that I just didn't go through it because I've done it before. But when you read, just read through what he did on that mountain when he came down to Sinai. If we learn to be terrified of God most high, do you, th do you think I could let you terrify? If I'm, you're going to make me do anything he don't want me to do, and I'm terrified of him, you're a little terror. I'd be just like the Messiah said, fear not him that can kill the body, he ain't a terror, but fear him who after he had destroyed the body can cast body and soul into hell. That's whom you fear. You didn't say that's just who you reference. It's who you fear. I think Sean Peter was really good. I, don't, I think that's a little five. I don't think it's a five and six. Five, six, and five. He killed him with a bitch. Bitch. Yeah. Why? Wow, bitch. You got a fast ocean out there with mountains up under, valleys up under. And that I didn't discover that it's that. <laughs> it's the silliest, one of the silliest things I think that they do on Earth. Peter, like, <laughs> be here all night. You know, we tired. Yeah. We have we have no five hour energy drinks. <laughs> no monsters. No no dos. We may have some licorice root. But that's a while, even licorice fruit still let you go to sleep. The centurion said, You ain't got to do all that. I got a little power I exercise. I can tell this person to do something, and they just do it. So, I mean, like, why, why, do, why do scriptures keep showing us the same thing? How we stop? <laughs> I thought you were going to say stupid. I'm glad you said stubborn. <laughs> But it, it's, the, it's the maturity. I like, I, I was asking myself, I'm thinking about why, why did the Messiah spend three years with him? It's like, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and then you still see growth. You'll still see growth in, in some of them after the fact. But it was good. Well, I thank you all. And you have anything, Andrina? Thank you. May the most high ever. Did you change your mind? Okay, you changed your mind. Go ahead, Patrick. Um, it made me think of Job 28. Um, when you get to like verse 20, mm -hmm. it'll say, Whence man cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? But it's after you saw about silver and gold, and you can't get wisdom for the price of gold. And then, you know, that even makes me think of in Peter, where he talks about uh, we weren't redeemed with uh, with uh, perishable, we were redeemed with, you know, the, the incorruptible or the uh, blood of Jesus. And so it shows you where um, where value really is. So it says, when when is then coming wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living. And kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understands the way thereof. So we go back to that's what you should fear. Mm -hmm. like, and destruction and death say, But we just heard the fame thereof. Well, we don't even really know. You know, remind me of um, the first Corinthians 2 where it talks about um, if they had known the Prince of the, the Prince of the world when I crucified the Lord of Glory. Mm. Um, and um then you see God understands the way He knows. God understands the way thereof, and He knows the place thereof. 
where he looked into the ends of the earth to see if under the whole heaven to make the way for the winds. And he waved the water by the heaven. So all those things you can look out and see the back and see the ocean. It's like he weighed all that like it was just like it was just a little like ten by the water bottle right there. Like it was just in a little water bottle. Like, all right, I'll move it. <laughs> I'll move that like it's that small. It's easy to tend to pick it up and drink. Like I was kind of like, all right, I'm just gonna visit it one. It's that good for you. You know, and that make you think of how should make you think of how vast it is, you know, like even when Solomon said, man. Now, who made this house for you, man? Hey, you know, the heaven and heaven and heaven is like, hey, you know, well, you know, we try to build this little house for you, you know? <laughs> so Don't stop there because I left out a verse that I wanted. Keep going. So, 66 and 2 and 3. Go ahead and read it. Since you since you were there, I'll let you read because I, I needed that. Huh? Yeah, Isaiah. Isaiah. All right, let's go to I don't know why I forgot it. Go ahead. To whom? Yeah. Read it loudly. Okay. Yes, where you would quote me anyway. This to this man will I honor, I will look to favorably, says the context. What who is he? Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And trembleth at my word. Mm. A lot of times people when you start talking about God's word, they'll run you out of the house. They won't invite you to the next family get together. They won't. And they'll act as if they're supposed to hurt you because you didn't go and sit around with people that didn't like you, want to be with you, and dishonor the most high. They will. Yes. A lot of days, probably almost every day, I think about, if I think about like, man, I'll be like, I'm talking to one of my cousins, like, man, literally, I'm like a whole nother life. I'm like, but the word really say it. The word really say you transform. That you've been translated to the kingdom of his dear son. Like, the word really says that. And I know we read, we're like, oh, yeah, that's the that sound. But it's like, no, we really actually take time to think about it and meditate on it. That's really what happened. Like, if you could see it, as seen it, I guess, truly in the spiritual realm, if you could see it, it would literally look like how you see something taken out of something and literally put into a whole nother thing, a whole nother way. And that's really what happened. It's like, man, I did. I don't know who that was. That's another person. Like, it really is. Like, I really. That's another person. I'm like, wow. And, you know, even walking today, there was this guy sitting, he was sitting somewhere. And uh, he started talking to me. He said a few things. He had said something about other people. And I said, no, I said, I said we, we in the world, we not of the world. <laughs> I said, we love that reason. <laughs> you know, and it go back to being swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to rap. If you, if you listen, and you can hear everything somebody's saying, you can hear where they're coming from. You can try to spirit like you're supposed to do. Because they might get tired of you asking, you know, certain way to try to like say something, move it somewhere else. And it's like, why does it sound like you're confusing? You just like, how you feel? And I was like, it's really about what's true. It's really about the truth, <laughs> not how you feel. I was somebody that don't. Somebody that believes something else can say, oh, I felt it. Oh, this felt like something. But I was like, what, what is good? I was like, good is what God has said. And what God said in his word, that's, that's what's good. So it's like, no, nah, don't try to say this other stuff. Try to move somebody to the side of me or move them to the side right here. It's like, no, so you just straight out here be asked, so what, what do you believe about Jesus and about his word? Because you just came to me talking about once you find out who I was, oh, you had fallen out with 
one of my relatives was about to work. So what do you believe if you had found out what? With one of my relatives about to work, but it's like, and that they teach me, what you're going against, trying to say stuff about changing on this corner and just on that. And I'm sitting in my, like, I think that ain't what I had. I said, what do you believe about Jesus and what do you believe about the word? And we get to another point and it's like, I got know what God told me, he told me, try to speak. He try to speak. So you getting up there or you saying the other stuff. You brought to me that you said you had a plan for it. Well, what do you believe? Because I ain't finna assume you was right when you had that conversation with them. I ain't even finna assume they right. But not I what I assume and not even an assumption, what is true is what the word of God said. So is your belief what the word God said? You know, people might have little things that are different and disagreements here and there, but it's like, what is what is the truth of Christ? What was the apostle when they were preaching as well? Do you have the do you agree on the foundation? Do you have that where it needs to be as it pertains to Jesus? Or do you have another thing that you and you say another Jesus? To me? That that's how we gonna okay, what do you believe? This what do you believe about? You said something, and I heard it don't line up with the word, and you just gave me another Jesus thing. What did he He said plenty of stuff about himself. He got plenty of opportunities to talk about him that knew him. He put his spirit in people for him to him. We have all those things that are to help us and aid us in doing it and learning and about wisdom and sin. This watch old get to the point when he gets to. In, in 42, he said, I heard you about it here in Israel, but he said, I, I've seen you, and I've seen you with my eyes. What is he saying? Because obviously you see the most high uh, face to face. We know no man can see him in there, but even when Jesus came, he said, ain't no man seen him, but this um, I seen him. But he said, if you seen me, you seen him, because I'm the express, I'm the express image, and I'm the express image of what he was talking about. I'm that, I look like if you seen me, you seen how you seen his character. Name, I can't quite declare his name. You've seen his character, you've seen his authority, you've seen what I do. I cast out the things by, I cast um, word that shows you something different. That means I'm, I'm, I'm on this level. I'm with the, y'all ain't on this level. Y'all don't know who you cast them out by, bro. You want to talk to who, who you, what that little ritual stuff y'all got to go and do? What that little extra stuff you got to do? I ain't do all that. Right, my father knew me. I know him. I'll be alive. I said I didn't know him. I'll be alive like you if I said I didn't know him. I know him. Don't call me like you know him. You don't. You said that was your fault. You said that. But you ain't look. You look at my eye. You know, I'm familiar though. You know him. You know him. You know him. You know You know him. 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 You Ill, oh, yeah, you're illegitimate. And that'd be the other thing. Well, this, one, this is what he told me to do respect. I said, that's not what he said. I'm looking at him like, no, he said, we the love, but at the same time, sometimes that's going to be, that's going to be hard sometimes. That, that's going to be hard. I said, when, when it came time, I said, I knew my daddy loved me. He told me before when he said such stuff, but I knew when he went up, I knew he went up and told me. Oh, boy. I knew you better stop or the belt is coming in. Did it force thunder? <laughs> I knew it would be. <laughs> it, would, it would go up like that. <laughs> so it's like when, when, when God thought the like with it. Hey, the, 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 back in the day, what the old folks used to say? When it was thunder. Say that, sir. Say that, sir. Oh, hey, 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 Oh, the even some of the hard, even some the of the some of the hardcore guys when it thunder really, really loud and hard, and this guy get black, <laughs> yeah. he starts seeing some humility. Yeah. It just, it just shows you. It's in the world coming. <laughs> <laughs> it shows you how far I this now, even with this. Want to take prayer out of the school. First thing started happening, you could have got school, get, get shot up. Man. I said, You couldn't catch the correlation there? 
that went, God ain't me to end so. Yeah, you know, they just not you to go. They said they don't understand the way they come. They coming in when the way ain't there. That's when they slide in. We here now. We here. What you gonna do? You don't know him. We gonna stay here hitting you in the face. So they said we heard the man. You know he famous. We, we don't heard about. We don't know. We don't know no way. God understands the way there was. He knows the place there was. For he looked into the ends of the earth and see it under the whole heaven to make the way for the wind. And he weighed the water by measure. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. So Ellie knew we saw said a lot of things similar to this. He kept talking about the weather. But that would come from out the north. You gotta know it come out the south. You know, you got your north wind, your south wind, your east wind. A lot of times they talk about the east wind, you see judgment. I believe in Genesis 41 that during Pharaoh had talked about it. So a lot of times when you saw east wind, you would see judgment. But then it was 31. One time I had to the plague to get rid of some, I believe, might have been local, where it was the West Wing. And he had it go way to move that, you know, away and up out of there. So they tried to about those different time, type of things where, okay, it's coming out of this side. Okay, that could be that. And that's why Jesus said, you know, okay, y'all, you look out there, you know something coming, you know weather coming. If you look on this, how, 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 how can you not design this little time? Since how can you not discern who I am and what I'm right here? You need to know that. Just like uh, one of the last ones that uh, that that Tim did, where he said, "Do we really know what time it is?" And when it made me go, so, uh, "We better know the word." Like when he said, "Y'all ain't discerning the time. Y'all ain't discerning. I'm right here in front of you. You knew them things like that. Okay, let's say them things get out of way. Do you know me? <laughs> that, that's how you get to know the time." I'm the redeemer of time because I'm the redeemer anyway. How many times is that? The redeemer, the redeemer, he coming. He gonna come to his place. The redeemer, they will capitalize it. He coming. <laughs> uh, Malachi, he starts coming. He coming. Coming to his, coming to his place. Studying. He coming to see about you. I'm here. Why are you desiring your time? You supposed to be doing this and that. Why are you listening to Malachi? Why are you listening to Isaiah? Why are you listening to Moses, who you say you follow, but I know you don't follow him. But you say you follow him. Yep. If you follow him, you believe what I'm saying. I'm always supposed to me. You would know these things. You search the group. You like how the Marine was. Like, they wasn't there yet. I'm <laughs> talking to them. But that's how we need to be. Search the scriptures and know that. Search the scriptures to see if these are true. That's what they did when Paul was talking. You don't just someone believe anything anybody's saying. You could be sitting up doing that. You could be sitting up asking. You better be sitting up listening to the spirit of the Lord. So you know what this is trying to tell you something. Then um, it says, and back in Job 28, when he made a decree for the rain and the way for the lightning of the thunder, then did he see? He saw and declared. So he didn't tell us what he see. He didn't see the good, he declared. Jesus saw him, but he could declare him because he was in his book. He can do it. He prepared it, yay, and searched it out. Right, he can try the reins of the heart, Jeremiah. He can try the thoughts that it tends to or he can see those things. And then verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear mm -hmm. of the Lord. Yeah. That is what. And to depart from evil is understanding. You're gonna depart from something. You either gonna depart from evil and be with him, or he gonna say, depart from me. He that work iniquity find out you, and you're gonna be departing from this prayer. Which one you want? Make a choice. Make a choice now to depart from evil. Make a choice now if you're gonna name his name and be one of them that depart from iniquity. That's right. So you can be with him. You know, iniquity, which is lawlessness. Don't be lawless, but be under the Lord. Hey, do what he tells you to do, what he command you to do at every moment that he you can do something. Do what he said, because you should be him. He went through all that that he went through on that before getting to the cross. Most would have got what they got to there before that. Most of us would have died before that. Before they even got to that point, would have died in the garden. That's why he, so he can make it to what he needs to get to. That when he praying for, we won't talk about that, though. They want to just say something else about it. Like, no, Jesus was always going to do the Father's will. Don't forget to do it. He didn't have a thought in his head. He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to do it. Lord, give me strength to get 
give me strength to get this that I'm about to have to do and get way through this without me. If I die early, they do. They do. I ain't do. They do. If I die early, they do. And your will, I need, I, I need your will to be done, Father. I will do your will more than anything. I need that. More, even more than that, they do. I need you. I need to do what you say to do. That was the thing. He, he feared so much. He had one of these for from him. That's what he knew. Was, he knew that was death. To be separate from That's what's scary. We be scared of that. When you read about what happened with Saul, you be scared of that. You see, he went all the way out of his mind. That's what an out of mind, when you go out of mind, that's there it is. Go read what happened to Saul. There it is. That's what happened with that. Something else come in with that. Have your tail like this. You need the spirit of the leader. The spirit of the Lord blow on the grass. They talk about the eyes of the hell. The spirit of the Lord The spirit of the Lord blow on the grass. The grass builds it. We go with it. We don't fade. You see how your body feels, something you like, oh, some days mine's like that. That need to let you know when you're feeling, when you feeling a little, sometimes your body feels a little weak. You really, you really should be starting to think about it. And anytime, regardless of what age you are, you really should be thinking about, you know what, I'm frail. I can I, this like it. This is, yeah, man, I don't feel as good this day. I, I better be thinking, you know, I need his spirit to blow on me. Like, hey, so we're to grow. I need to do, like to do anyone. I need that do, which is how he is the view of his view. I need that all the time. I need that on a daily basis. That's where you're healing from. He sent his word and he healed me. Mm. That's what he, he sent 